much for, for sharing this space. Thanks, of course, to Lisa Jarno um, and to Helen Welker and the Beg the Right Picture series. Um, I'm Mike Went, I'm the program director at Woodland Pattern. I have a few uh, things to introductory remarks, but before I'd like to begin by saying that um, we at Woodland Pattern acknowledge that in Milwaukee, we live and work in traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, part of North America's largest system of freshwater lakes where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin Sovereign and Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We further acknowledge the grave evil colonialism introduced to these lands through genocide as well as slavery, but also via racist and xenophobic beliefs, laws, and practices and that um, continue to inflict harm upon black, brown, and indigenous lives. We honor those who have lived and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience and are committed to the active dismantling of white supremacy. Um, once again, thank you so much um, to the Beg the Right Lecture Series, to Ellen Welker for partnering with us as a host venue for this talk. I'm incredibly grateful for that partnership and, and excited to host Lisa Jarno once again. Um, even if not at Woodland Pattern. Um, the Beg the Right Lecture series on poetry supports contemporary poets as they explore in depth their own thinking on poetry and poetics and give a series of lectures resulting from these investigations. Lectures are delivered publicly in partnership with institutions nationwide um, and can find out more about what they're doing, um, including an archive of past lectures at begleywrightlectures.org. Um, which, in fact, I can share with you here. Um, so we do have books for sale uh, at Woodland Pattern by Lisa Charno, um, uh, and those can be found through our online book center. Um, those include, uh, I don't know if you're seeing me, but uh, Joie de Vivre and Princess Magic Presto Spell, two books here. Um, so we'll share that link to our online book center and uh, visit us there in lieu of the physical space for now, right? Um, uh, and, and this is our, our closing program of, of 2020. So I just, I, you know, without going uh, into all the things we all already know about this year, I did want to take a moment just to say a huge thank you to everyone who's um, presented with us, partnered with us, attended events and workshops, provided financial support, and otherwise um, were there for and with Within Pattern over the past year. Um, it really has meant so much for all of us to, um, to see that, that there are so many willing to adapt with us. Um, and it's allowed us to, to continue to nurture and even grow our community over the past year, which is pretty remarkable. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just been a, a light in an otherwise um, pretty dark year. Um, and of course, this thanks includes Lisa Charno and Beg the Right Lecture Series and Ellen. Um, so I hope you'll join us again in the new year um, and for some incredibly exciting programs. One in particular I'd like to draw your attention to really quickly is our 27th annual um, Poetry Marathon, which this year will be virtual, um, take place over two days and 24 hours. Um, so here's a link directly to that. And then also there, woodlandpattern.org is the, the main page of the website where you can find out more about other upcoming programs. And there's quite a lot of amazing stuff happening in 2021, um, continuing virtual programming, of course, for the, for the time being. Um, and uh, finally, I'll say in order to create the um, greatest possible access to our programming. Limb Patterns events have been presented on a, a give what you can basis. Um, with this in mind, I'll share a link here. If you're, if you're, if you're in a position to give, we'd be deeply grateful for your support um, as, a, as a nonprofit organization. Um, it means quite a lot. But more than that, just being here with us is really the most important form of support. And I can't thank you enough for that. And we will have time after the talk for a Q&A. Um, so give some consideration as you're um, of course listening to the, to the talk about any thoughts, questions you'd like to share. And those will be fielded via the chat when the, that time comes. OK, so now we can move on. And it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Lisa Jarno who is the author of several collections of poetry, including A Princess Magic Presto Spell, 
Joie de Vivre, uh, Black Dog Songs, Night Scenes, and Ring of Fire. She co-edited an antho edited an anthology of new American poets and her biography of San Francisco poet Robert Duncan, the ambassador from Venus, was published by the University of California Press in 2012. She has been a visiting okay, professor at- Okay, we are, okay, University great. All Open right, College. thank you. Oh. It's Carl. Hey, Carl. Um, and Anne. Um, she has been a visiting professor at Norfolk University, Brooklyn College, and the University of Colorado Boulder. She lives in Jackson Heights, Queens, is a homeschooling mom, and is a Master's of Divinity candidate at New York Theological Seminary. Lisa Jarno's writing is marked uh, by, among other things, accumulation, uh, collections of language, experience, and form endlessly reconstituted and recontextualized, circling back on themselves. It's a poetics of investigation and continual evolution. This seems the perfect sort of thinking to um, Mm, flesh out the kind of fundamentally necessary, if also perhaps unanswerable questions are now poses in the description of this talk. Questions around the balance of social, political, and personal responsibilities within the context of often troubled artistic lineages. Questions for which the process of con continually asking seems itself an important kind of response. Charnot's is writing that continually asks. Through, quote, conjuries of events, Jarno's poetry is, quote, teeming with life, these sober engines dreaming the last days of the rare full moon. It's writing that is formally and linguistically daring with tesseraic transp transpositions of word and phrase, accretions of thought and image where meditations on death and fear of extinction live alongside, quote, two snow monkeys, two rabid beavers, poor Franz Kafka, and so many things between where social, political, and personal life intersect um, and are inextric inextricably linked, um, as is the case outside the poem, right? It's within this plurality, the continual understanding and articulation of overlapping vectors of thought and experience, where Jarno meets the vicissitudes of language and life with a genuine and revolutionary sense of joy and love and of possibility. And it's, of course, that last point which seems so important in the context of what this talk proposes to address, seeing and reckoning with what is and what has been, while also envisioning what can be. Uh, the sentiment is everywhere in what has been noted as uh, Charno's restless virtuosity and relentless curiosity. As Juliana Spar tells us, quote, Lisa Charno writes the meter of everything, and she does this, or as she does this, she reminds us what matters. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Charno. Thank you, Mike. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, I can't tell you, I, uh, when, when Carl and Ann signed on, I was just, I thought, all right, now we can start. Um, so um, I've got uh, some friends here who uh, are not poets and uh, I'm very happy to see them here. And I've got some friends here who are poets and uh, I saw that, that Chuck signed on and he he was at another one of these talks and asked a question that I never answered. So now I'm feeling like I'm gonna have to answer that. And I I uh, I pulled out some photos from my last time at Woodland Pattern. Here's my kiddo with uh, with Chuck and we were bird watching. Okay. And then we went down to the lake. Carl and Ann. You remember that? Yeah. With with this little kiddo who's now 11. All right. Sorry. I just this is a chance to you know I I just like when I think about the reason I'm a poet I think about community and um this is a community here and it's it's a fantastic Thing, I mean, as horrible as pandemic life is, having this platform where folks can get together from different parts of the country, it's, uh, well, I'm, I'm happy. That's all I can say. And so thank you all for being here. Um, thank you, uh, Woodland Pattern. Um, thank you, Alan, who has been, Alan, uh, it has been setting up these readings for me uh, through the Bagley Wright lecture series, and it's just a delight to do this work. So 
Um, so that said, I, I'm going to um, start by saying a couple things. Um, I've given this talk twice before. Uh, this is the last time I'm giving it. It's the first of um, a, a series of four lectures I'm going to be giving. And um, I'm going to encourage you all tonight to um, be a little bit active in um, if you have questions as I'm uh, talking, um, just use the chat, uh, use the chat box. And, um, and also, um, let's try to imagine that we are in some space kind of together and that it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, yeah, that's it. Chuck's got that going now. All right. You see, um, so, uh, yeah, let's, let's just, uh, have a, have a good poetry time. Uh, so um, I should also begin by saying that I, I sometimes think um, my capacity for earnestness is either my superpower or my fatal flaw. Um, so um, I'm gonna be very earnest tonight. I'm gonna kind of let it all hang out and uh, I'm hoping that you'll find something useful in that um, and not, not something dreadful in my earnestness. Uh, as my, my 11 year old kid often finds it dreadful, but. <laughs> uh, and um, I've decided to frame these talks as a, I guess what I'll call a, a call story or a, a, you know, a, testi a testimony about my work, but also equally importantly, I think uh, a testimony about a tradition in American poetry that has, it's both, absolutely sustained me. Um, and I would think I could say it's appropriate to say that it's absorbed me into it as much as I have absorbed it over, you know, you know now 35 years of, of writing. Uh, and what, when I think about what this tradition is, uh, which we might call an American experimental or open verse poetry originating out of Whitman and Dickinson um, and maybe out of w William Blake before that. Um, I know for me that it has always been uh, populated by white men. Uh, there are some white whales in there as in Melville's white whale in the novel Moby Dick, 1851. And also I'm going to uh, put add in uh, Whitehead as in Alfred North Whitehead uh, and particularly his uh, cosmological theological treatise uh, process and reality from 1929. Uh, and it sounds like a kind of complicated barrel of monkeys, all of those things put together. But, but I'd like to frame it tonight as something um, to explore and be curious about. Uh, the other thing I want to be clear about from the beginning of this talk is that I'm not a fancy poet, uh, even as I'm invoking these uh, big books by Melville and, and Whitehead. I don't, I don't want to uh, wield these texts as intellectual currency. I want to use them to tell a story. Uh, and I seem to have the mind of a poet, which makes me kind of good at poaching and weaving texts. Um, but not so inclined to traditionally academic discourse. So uh, this leads me to a second note, which is that I'm, I also describe myself as a townie, uh, which is uh, what the language poet Ron Silliman once called me, uh, meaning that like him, I'm a local yokel who found myself in an intellectual world by accident of being really at the, at the right low tuition public university at the right time. Um, in Ron's case, it was UC Berkeley in the 1960s. And in my case, it was uh, the State University of New York at Buffalo in the 1980s. It seems to me that the inspiration behind poems is often a feeling that something is desperately wrong or that something is desperately right. And out of one or the other of these emergencies, something must be said, which leads to the rant or the elegy about the desperately wrong thing or to the ode or love poem about the desperately right thing. My specific context of being of European descent 
and from a working class family, female, and as I said, a local yokel citizen of the United States, uh, really led me to the extremes of, of these feelings of, of both poles, that, that there was something desperately right and something desperately wrong about the time and place I, I lived in. Uh, it was mostly that by the time I was in elementary school, I knew that something was wrong on the local temporal level of what I'll call God and country and shopping mall. And then simultaneously that something was desperately right on an eternal level, that there was an order somewhere around me in, in nature that was both unifying and liberating, which is what I would later come to find expressed in writers like Melville and Whitehead. In my earnest romanticism, I'm curious about whether or not there was something particular about my visceral response to these feelings of wrongness and rightness and my need to vocalize them through writing, which is to say, I wonder whether, I wonder whether or not poetry is a call. I've heard call stories and testimonies in religious communities and they all share a familiar framework that uh, you know, something, the something happened to me framework of uh, one day I was walking down the street and I, I saw a cross or I, I saw a church or someone called me reverend and so on. In the circles I swing in as a poet, the call story often starts with Allen Ginsberg, as in, I once was lost, but then I found Allen Ginsberg's howl. Uh, and I'll say it was a surprise to me and a little bit of a disappointment to learn that I was not the only one who had been called into poetry by Howell during my senior year of high school. <laughs> and that in fact, one of my other early heroes, Ed Sanders had had that same experience when he was in his senior year of high school in Missouri nearly 30 years before I had the experience and that many of my subsequent poetry students had the same experience in their senior years of high school decades later in places like New Jersey and Iowa and Ohio. So I'll begin there because it's my story and it's also my community's story. When I was in my mid-teens, I spent a lot of time playing a tennis racket air guitar in my brother's bedroom and listening to records that we'd managed to pick up at the department store down on Route 5. It was an accident or incident around my air guitar jam sessions that tipped me off to the constellation of prophetic voices that included Allen Ginsberg. And it began when I came across an elegy called Ballad of Hollis Brown, in which the author, Bob Dylan, at the age of 22, pinned down a picture of the something that is desperately wrong and I remember seeing Dylan perform that ballad on television in 1984, 1985 with his kind of typical hard to follow phrasings. Uh, and I remember actually what uh, one, of my, one of my aunts saying, uh, uh, well, that was really terrible. And, and I thought, wow, that was really great. And I, I had some, I somehow absorbed not, probably not every word of it, but every ounce of the, of the pathos of, of what Dylan was doing in that moment. And if you know the song, uh, Ballad of Hollis Brown, it's not, it's not based in historical fact. It's a, it's a tale about a farmer in South Dakota who's starving, and in desperation, he, he loads his shotgun and he blows out the brains of his wife and his five children, and then he kills himself. And I found myself running off to my room to make notes about how incredibly transcendent it had been to hear this, how viscerally moved I was. At which point I think I, I felt deeply that poetry on the level that Dylan was presenting it as a prophetic art was a matter, was actually a matter of life and death. And I also felt that I was not going to be able to turn away from participating in it. I want to define here what I mean by prophetic art, because I think that phrase can feel unapproachable, uh, especially in a, in a secular context. Um, and it can definitely be misunderstood as some kind of hocus pocus that you know involves crystal balls. Uh, 
my definition of prophetic art is informed by the writing of Old Testament scholar and theologian Walter Brueggemann. I would say a prophetic art is an art that points, points out a difficulty in a present moment, relates it to a previous failing within a social contract, and gives the listener options for potential, you know, good or bad outcomes, depending on what folks do in relation to having heard the prophecy. Another way to say this is that a prophetic art is one in which the prophet is attuned to a higher order of things. Uh, some people might call it God, or some people might call it ethics or common sense, common decency. Uh, Spinoza makes it simple. Uh, he defines a prophet as one who interprets the revelation of God, but he adds, he adds this line that I, I really like in relation to poetry. He says, prophecy implies not a peculiarly perfect mind, but a peculiarly vivid imagination. So, um, I'm going to bring Walter Brueggemann's words directly into the conversation because he's he's such a brilliant writer and he's now about 87 um, and I think he still is one of the clearest prophetic voices in this world that we live in which you know we could certainly describe as a global fascist late capitalist climate collapse world um, but he, write, he writes uh, in a recent book, a book called The Practice of Prophetic Imagination. He says, it is the work of 21st century prophetic preachers. I'll, I'll add poets, right? We have a few preachers here. I, I see Reverend Dr. Coachman is here. <laughs> it is the work of 21st century prophetic preachers and poets to name the denial and to identify the infidelities that make our common life toxic. It is the work of 21st century prophetic preachers and poets to name the despair and witness to the divine resolve for newness that may break the vicious cycle of self-destruction and make new common life possible. What was haunting for me about the Bob Dylan ballad was the acknowledgement of that despair embedded in the American landscape and implied in that was the despair of what Brueggemann identifies as democratic capitalism and militant consumerism. And in, in back of that, of course, the doctrine of discovery, colonialism and slavery. Uh, Dylan's ballad reminded me that through an ethos of American individualism, some people are going to perish and some people are going to thrive and for the most part, few people are going to say a word about it and even fewer people are going to act to change things. I would add to that also that this, the way that I wrote that sentence originally, it sounds like this is just uh, accidental or, or an, I, that, that, that it's just by chance that this happens. But of course, you know, this is, um, when we talk about the doctrine of discovery, when we talk about colonialism, when we talk about slavery, it's very, very much not an accident. Um, I still feel haunted in the same way by the opening of the second section of Ginsburg's Howl, the, the Moloch section. I'm just gonna read a, a little part of that here. What sphinx of cement and aluminum bashed open their skulls and ate up their brains and imaginations. Moloch, solitude, filth, ugliness, ash cans and unobtainable dollars, children screaming under the stairways, boys sobbing in armies, old men weeping in the parks. Moloch, the incomprehensible prison. Moloch, the crossbone, soulless jailhouse and Congress of Sorrows. Moloch, whose buildings are judgment. Moloch, the vast stone of war. I'm writing here in this lecture about how certain white men and certain tales of white whales and a certain white Hedian cosmology gave me the sustenance to begin to abandon Moloch and how I learned from those sources 
those white men and white whales and whitehead, uh, how I learned to begin to conspire with others who suffered, even when my efforts were imperfect. I've been trying to trace that that trajectory through my early notebooks from hearing the Bob Dylan song about of Hollis Brown to reading Allen Ginsberg's liner notes. So Ginsberg wrote the liner notes for Bob Dylan's album Desire, which I think is 1975. And then because of that, discovering Allen Ginsberg's poems and then Jack Kerouac's work and then um, things like Alan Watts, uh, The Way of Zen and Abby Hoffman's Revolution for the Hell of It. And a few years later, uh, coming to the poet Robert Duncan and the novelist Hen Her Herman Melville. I was going to say Henry Miller, but Henry Miller's in there too. <laughs> and, uh, and Whitehead and so on. Um, which, uh, as I uh, say all those names, you if, if you're familiar with them, you will know that those are all a whole big pile of white men. Their white maleness rarely appalled me because I saw the intentions they were setting in their various poetics of liberation. Dylan's content on race told me something that no one had ever explained to me at school about what it meant to be black and or poor within the system and subsequently what it means to be white and privileged within the system. And I would say, which I'm sure other folks in this room would also say they've had they had this experience uh, you know not only had my community as a when I was a kid you know never revealed a truthful narrative but uh, you know had also really upheld racism at every turn Dylan was a white man in my poetical lineage, but he simultaneously was the first example for me of what a white co-conspirator might look like with his ballads about Medgar Evers and Haiti Carroll and Reuben Carter and Davy Moore and George Jackson. And with his insistence that America had no future because as he said in an interview more recently, it's a country founded on the backs of slaves. I can go back to those, you know, first notebooks that I kept and, and find, I find some very reverent pencil written transcriptions of Kerouac and Ginsburg's ideas. Um, uh, Kerouac in the Dharma bomb saying, I didn't feel that I was an American at all. And, uh, and Ginsburg from his journals, um, early 1950s, embracing this really multifaceted inclusive queerness and um, I'm going to read this to you again because I, it's really beautiful. At 14, I was an introvert, an atheist, a communist, and a Jew. Just you can just hear that the, the joy uh, that that Alan had in this kind of this kind of prose. At 14, I was an introvert, an atheist, a communist, and a Jew, and I still wanted to be president of the United States. At 19, being no longer a virgin, I was a cocksucker and believed in a supreme reality, an anarchist, a hipster, totally apolitical Reiki, and I wanted to be a great poet instead. At 22, I was a hallucinating mystic believing in the city of God and I wanted to be a saint. I just love that. I don't, I actually don't know where it is. I had it written in a notebook and I it didn't, it didn't say what, it's probably from some of his journals, his early journals. For me, folks like Dylan and Kerouac uh, and, and Ginsburg, they were, they were the Ishmaels of Moby Dick and not the Ahabs. They, they, were, they weren't the ones steering the ship and they didn't want to. They were the ones waking up in the arms of communist Jews, anarchists, and even cannibals happily and going to see to read the signs of the heavens. Even later, when I came to Ezra Pound's poetry, it was clear that mad as he was, there had been something he had been searching for through the form of the poem that was meant to open the possibilities for how we see the world rather than to close it. Uh, hearing testimonies from the first generation influenced by him from 
Robert Duncan and from the filmmaker Stan Brackage and from poet Jackson McLow about the ecstasy of coming to Pound's Cantos was a, a clue in itself, right? That someone is queer as Duncan and someone as much of a misfit as Brackage and someone of Jewish heritage as McLow was could all cleave to that work uh, and could be so powerfully informed and transformed by it. It told me that there was something in Pound's work besides fascist dogma. You know, it wasn't, it, it's still, it, you know, over the last summer, I was told that Naropa don't, if you teach Pound, the students are gonna walk out. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna teach Pound because there's something in Pound that you, you can't just throw that out. There was, for me, there was an agony involved in having deep feelings about the fact that something was very wrong, but not having really anyone else within a community to mirror that back to me. Uh, I, I found I, in uh, one, another one of my notebooks, a, a passage of Ginsburg talking about just this when he, when he was fairly young, he says, he describes the challenge of knowing how to feel human and holy and trying not to feel like a madman, that's a very Ginsbergian word, madman in a world which is rigid and materialistic. There was also something kind of agonizing about having prophetic creative energy alongside having very primitive skills as a poet uh, and a, really a great distrust for any curriculum other than basically the liner notes of a, of a Bob Dylan album. So it was that sort of agitation, I think that when we look, I, this is where I wanna bring Melville in and, and Moby Dick. It was that sort of agitation that drove Ishmael to ship out on the Pequod, right? And this is, a, I was thinking about this quote today from the opening of, of Moby Dick because I was so much feeling, I'm sure a lot of folks here are feeling this, like the cabin fever of the winter and being locked down, right? Uh, so Melville writes, this is Ishmael speaking, whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos gets such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to see as soon as I can. I went to see in a way I didn't expect to and my Pequod was a community within the University of Buffalo, a small band of Ishmaels working for Ahabs. The most important of these Ishmael figures for me were two white male poets, Robert Creeley and John or Jack Clark. They were both in the English department, though I don't think that either of them ever felt they particularly belonged there. Uh, and they were both disheveled <laughs> in a way that Ishmael's shipmates were in Moby Dick. Uh, Bob had lost an eye as a kid in a, in a car accident and uh, he, his, his parents had gotten him a plas plastic eyeball he was supposed to wear and he, let it roll across the floor one day and never put it back in. So he uh, showed up everywhere with that kind of wonderful off kilter squint. And, uh, and uh, Jack Clark uh, had had polio as a kid. So he kind of, when I first met him, I saw him hobbling through the hallway of the university, He's kind of swinging his briefcase, this kind of funny, steady determination. Those two were both heirs to an experimental American tradition that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. Uh, Bob was a New Englander. Uh, he was a Harvard dropout. He was, uh, a lot of you know Creeley's work. I would say he was a poet on, you know, of the lineage of Dickinson and Williams, but also of that stature. Um, as for Jack Clark, I guess I'd have to describe him as something of a Midwestern polymath. Uh, in addition to being a poet, he was a jazz musician and a Blake scholar. Uh, 
And in his first years on the faculty at Buffalo, he had met the poet Charles Olson and they became fast friends. Neither Bob Creeley nor Jack Clark were mentors in any conventional sense. Bob was at his best with people as a friend and he always craved what he would call a down home sociality. He had very little interest in assuming any mantle of authority. Jack was definitely something other than a college professor, though he hid it well under his tweed jacket and his owl-like glasses and his goatee. I know when the tide turned for me exactly, when I realized that I actually could get something out of going to college. It was on an afternoon in one of Jack Clark's classes when he entered into a conversation with a student, you know, one of those kind of Long Island football jocks. We, we had a lot of these guys that at SUNY Buffalo, um, we had a lot of fraternities and sororities and, uh, and uh, Jack suggested to this football player kid that he might understand that we were reading Hesiod. We were, it was a class on um, Homer and Hesiod and, and, uh, and uh, the Greeks and, and Jack suggested to this kid that he might understand the reading material better if he took some psychedelic mushrooms. <laughs> It, it was about a, a week into that class that I really surrendered to, you know, thinking uh, I would apply myself to uh, learning something in, in this circumstance. And I, I found when I was looking at my notebooks, I found that I had scrawled in a notebook around week three in that class, I love Odysseus. <laughs> uh, which, I, which I have to say again is, uh, you know, to, to speak about this, the, the, white, the white male, there, there it is. But um, it makes me think of a time when, uh, more recently when I, I'm a seminary student at New York Theological Seminary and I was standing outside of Riverside Church uh, with a couple of my fellow seminary students and uh, we had just come out of a class, uh, Old, Old Testament, or we, we call it First Testament. And, uh, and one, of, one of the other students said, she. She said, she said, I know King David was a whoremonger, but I love him anyway. <laughs> um, as for Bob Creeley, uh, I remember working up the courage to introduce myself to him on, on my first day of classes and, and saying to him, I'm going to sign up for a poetry writing workshop and write poems, you know. And he was really opposed to this idea, uh, you know, just to the idea of entering into a contract um, within an academic world to, to learn how to turn out poems as products. Uh, and he definitely had either declined or had not been invited to, to teach creative writing classes. They only gave him intro to literature classes, mostly when he was teaching at Buffalo. So, so you know, he said to me in this kind of gentle brotherly way, he said, um, you know, if you want to be a poet, maybe you could study languages and history so you have something to write about. <laughs> uh, I think what I learned really quickly about Jack and Bob was that they were both thoroughly disinterested in poetry as a commodity. And they were really also disinterested in forcing poems into existence. At the same time, they were entirely committed to breaking down and maneuvering around any form that restricted freedom, you know, and uh, a form of a poem, the prosodic form, any academic form, any social form, any political form, uh, which is why I'm so willing to configure them using our contemporary cultural jargon as allies or co-conspirators, right? I, I think of, you know, uh, if uh, a conversation came up in those circumstances, especially with Bob Creeley about a poet like Robert Frost, right, um, or any of the poets who were the new, the new critics, um, uh, Creeley would just fume about the travesty of those tedious closed systems, right? Um, the, the Frost poem, two, you know, two roads diverge in a yellow wood and Sorry, I could not travel both. Um, you know, this idea of manifest destiny in the, in the New England poem of having, having space in America to, to travel on and just taking it for granted that it's one, one's own. Uh, you know, and I remember Creeley saying, well, why doesn't the son of a bitch just stay where he is? 
so yeah, so they um, confirmed what I suspected that the retreat, certainly that the retreat of the poem into academic institutions was the death of a prophetic tradition. And, you know, I remember also a, a very, a young, very slick poet coming through town um, uh, one autumn, you know, from a, an MFA program. At that point, I don't think I knew what an MFA program was, but there were folks being trained to be poets in these master's programs. Um, and uh, this guy gave a reading and I remember Jack and Bob, you know, deliberating with each other about his work and, and Jack was kind of doing on his lip and wrinkling his brow and saying, well, you know, he could go either way. <laughs> And I, I still carry that with me to a fault sometimes, I think, because I, you know, I do have friends who can stomach certain kinds of poems and poets. And, and I think to myself, well, if you want something that pretty, you know, that you could just go down to Pottery Barn and look at the furniture. I, I said this, I said this at Harvard and someone called me on that. They said, well, that's very judgmental. I'm just gonna stand. I'm just gonna stand with that right now though. Um, in the same way that Bob Dylan and Allen Ginsberg had employed an earnest prophetic content, the writers who I came to know through Bob and Jack employed an earnest prophetic form. They gave me an understanding that received systems are meant to be interrogated, opened, and rearranged. They showed me a world on the page, you know, the poem on the page, that in no way resembled what I had seen in any literature anthology. Uh, to break with a poetic formalism implied breaking with acceptable social behavior and acceptable social alliances. It meant crossing color lines. Bob Creeley's rhythm as a poet came not just out of William Carlos Williams, but also out of Max Roach. The prophetic tendency was often subtle in the content of Creeley's work, but not always. I think of his poem, America. Now this one, um, I'm gonna actually play uh, this, this poem. I'm gonna share the screen here uh, because I want you to hear his voice. Uh, Cause when I read it, it's not quite the same thing. Uh, so advanced sharing options. All right, that's good. Share computer sounds. Aren't you glad I know how to do this, Mike? <laughs> let's see how let's see how it goes. All right. So uh... America. America, you owed for reality. Give back the people you took. Let the sun shine again on the four corners of the world. You thought of first, but do not own or keep like a convenience. People are your own word. You invented that locus and term. Here, you said and say, is where we are. Give back what we are, these people you made, us, and nowhere but you to be. nice huh give back the people you took uh and then later in the poem give give back what we are that, that i you know i don't know i i've known that poem for so many years and to, to read it uh you know again and think that i just i i just never saw how much that was what a what a beautiful critique that that was of um what this country is, right? The, poten the potential for what, you know, what should happen in the world, give back what we are. Uh, so it was that, it was hearing that in Creeley, it was William Blake's work and, you know, and, and, and Blake, Blake's uh, 
etch etching plates and Whitman's barbaric yapping stanzas and Olson's and Robert Duncan's field theory that all for me prophetically rebelled against what was wrong with the world. And, and Duncan habitually explained this in his poems, his anarchist disdain for polite order. Um, let me say, I know that a lot of you know who Robert Duncan is when I talk about this, but I'm gonna contextualize it because not everyone in this space right now is a poet. So um, Robert Duncan, San Francisco poet born in, in 1919, contemporary with Creeley, um, they were both of the Black Mountain School of Poetry alongside Charles Olson and Denise Levertov and others. Um, uh, Duncan habitually explained this in his poems, his anarchist disdain for polite order and his love affair with the idea that creative work has a life force that makes it a living part of the universe. It took me a long time to understand what he was writing about in, in his first full length collection, The Opening the Field. But it's, this, it's the same thing that Walter Brueggemann is talking about when he describes a prophetic ministry as one that upends the question of right or left wing politics. Duncan flat out rejects what he calls man-made laws, including the constitution of the United States, right? Uh, he talks about seeking a law with a capital L, which I think we might define, he might define as, you know, an evolving order of the universe, um, which is, he gets this idea out of Whitehead. Um, so there's a poem of Duncan's in, uh, written in the late, uh, mid late 1950s called The Law I Love is Major Mover. At the time he's reading from the Gospel of John, he's reading Whitehead. Um, it's definitely written during the midst of his obsession with process and reality. Uh, and um, I'm gonna show this to you. I'm gonna, this is my second screen share. Um, so, and, here we go. Let me read it. Here, beautiful damned man that lays down his law, lays down himself, creates hell, a sentence unfolding healthy heaven. Thou wilt not allow the suns to move, nor man to mean desire move. Look, the angel that made a man of Jacob made Israel in his embrace was the law, was syntax. Him I love is major mover. That's a poem that I wouldn't suggest reading as particularly a Christian poem, but uh, it's he's definitely making use of that um, there's a couple things. The reason I wanted you to, you to see it on the screen is I want you to see law in the first sentence that is lowercase and it's it's related to what humans make and law his big with the capital L there. Um, when he says law was syntax, it's great too because it's like law was also logos. So it, it does kind of um, collapse back on that kind of Gnostic thing. Let me stop the share and just uh, I think that eternal law, right, what she calls that major mover or that prime mover, actually, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't so much belong to the church and it, it definitely doesn't belong to the, to the state, right? Um, there's a touch of Spinoza's thinking involved in, in, in this, um, Spinoza makes the dis same distinction between human law and divine law, and he dismisses human law. He says, uh, human law is a plan of living which serves only to render the state secure. Duncan's major mover, his, his God, is glimpsed through the creative processes of the poem and of the universe. 
Uh, and that's something that um, when I was working on the Duncan biography, it's something that uh, Don Bird told me. Don Bird had been a student at in Kansas in the late 60s. And he said that he was there when Duncan gave some readings of his passages poems. Now, the, this would have been, um, this was in 1969. So Duncan was reading the passages poems. Uh, some of them go very deeply into what Duncan saw as, you know, the complete Satanism of the, the Vietnam War. And, uh, and Don Bird said that during this reading, um, you know, Duncan, Duncan's in the midst of reading the darkest of the passages poems and, and Duncan suddenly stops and he says, uh, you know, sometimes people ask me why if I, if I believe this, I bother to write poetry. I write poetry for the fucking stars. I had come to Duncan's prophetic anarchist imagination through a graduate seminar that Bob Creeley taught in the fall of 1987. Uh, Creeley was interested in reading deeply through the works of three of his contemporaries, Duncan, Charles Olson, and John Ashbery. I don't really know that he got to Ashbery. He, he really was more interested in talking about Duncan and, and Olson, but um, but I didn't know any of that work. So I said, can I sit in on that class? And he said, sure. And, you know, this was a wild space, when it, certainly when it comes to the theme of white, white men, because it was a weekly three hour seminar with about a dozen graduate students. They were all guys, they were all white guys. They all seemed very mature to me. Um, I was, I guess, about 18. And, you know, they must have been probably only in their mid 20s, mostly. And, uh, and the guys always brought cigarettes for Bob and he wasn't really supposed to be smoking anymore. So he enjoyed the fact that he could have this moment um, in this classroom to sneak cigarettes. And, you know, the more he smoked, the more personal it got. And he, um, you know, in, he would began to relate the poems to the friendships he had with Olson and Duncan. And it was all a little bit body. Um, but what I also remember about it is that Bob was really insistent on maintaining a space for me in that company and in, cre in creating a narrative for me and you know hopefully especially for the for the guys there about frankly what was wrong with patriarchal thinking particularly Olson's uh, you know even as he was speaking about very dear friendships and very great poems my first real hearing of Duncan's work was also in that space with Bob reciting an early collage composition of Duncan's called the Venice poem from 1947 uh, which, if you know it, is very ornate and very dramatic and very queer, and which was not, um, didn't seem like uh, Creeley's cup of tea at all, but, um, but uh, he read the poem, read it out loud, long poem, and, you know, he, he would pause here and there and say, um, this is really gorgeous, it, or Creeley, Creeley was, this, you, he would say, this is really gorgeous, you dig. <laughs> um, and I really did dig that, but I, I had no idea why. I just knew that in this Duncan poem, there were what I would call re recesses. There were hiding places within the poem. And that it was the kind of thing that, it was so complex. It was the kind of thing my mom would have said, like if she had heard this poem, she would have said, well, you know, he, he just thinks too much. <laughs> um, and it, it was, doing things that no that as far as I, I could tell no no poem was supposed to do uh, and in the same way that Allen Ginsberg had said things in the poem that I knew no one was allowed to say Duncan was doing things in the form of the poem that no one was allowed to do he was creating an atmosphere and a, and a world out of a, you know a collage of very disparate elements um, and that included notes from a medieval history course he, he'd taken at Berkeley with Ernest Kantorovich and lines from Stravinsky's Poetics of Music and uh, you know and then also interspersed with that really excruciatingly personal journal entries of his own about the end of a relationship including a moment where he outs himself as a cocksucker. Uh, it was a really very similar feeling to one that I had had in hearing Dylan's ballad of Hollis Brown for the first time. And I knew that Robert Duncan had begun a conversation that was not allowed for in the world I inhabited. But again, it was more than that. 
it gave me a feeling of awe and a feeling that a lot of people had been hiding this good stuff from me because, you know, it was not mind numbing. It was, uh, I would say, you know, poetry at its best in, in dangers, the state's ability to keep the culture numb. I mentioned something at the beginning of this talk about waking up in the arms of cannibals and short circuiting the power of the Ahab steering the ships. If you've read Moby Dick, you know that the cannibal who Ishmael shares a bed with is named Queequeg and that Queequeg arrives at the beginning of the novel to figuratively penetrate Ishmael. Queequeg is the dark skinned cannibal that the Roman historian saw in the dark skinned Palestinian Jesus with his cult of body and blood. Ishmael says from their bridal chamber, as he calls it in, in, the, in the wailing in while they're waiting to, to set out to sea. Uh, Ishmael says, I began to be sensible of strange feelings. I felt a melting in me. No more my splintered heart and maddened hand were turned against the wolfish world. This soothing savage had redeemed it. I would just point out the word re redemption, redeem there in relation to the Christ. There he sat, his very indifference speaking a nature in which there lurked no civilized hypocrisies and bland deceits, I began to feel myself mysteriously drawn towards him. I'll try a pagan friend, thought I, since Christian kindness has proved but hollow courtesy. It's a sublime connectedness, a sublime co-conspiracy that Ishmael and Queequeg come into in that moment. And it seems to me that every time I've come into something sublime in my life, it's been accompanied by a feeling of being totally out of my depths, out of control. And it's often a sign that they're gener incredibly generative, but also dangerously heated forces at work. That was the case for me with poetry. In the Duncanian line of thinking, such strange feelings and meltings as Ishmael describes them are a sure sign that gnosis is active as a presence and gnosis is as wild as eros. And in my experience, they have often been collaborators. The other part of my life at the university that autumn was a job I'd stumbled into in the rare books collection in the library system, which was exactly the place where gnosis and eros were running amok. The Ahab-like curator of the collection happened to be a scholar of Robert Duncan's poetry. Duncan was then 68 years old. Uh, he was terminally ill with kidney and heart disease. And the curator of the collection at the University of Buffalo had made a number of trips to San Francisco that year and the previous year uh, to bring back a very big fish, which was the whole of Duncan's manuscripts, notebooks, and library. I think I must have, leaving that class of Creeleys, having heard the Venice poem, I must have just gone back to that library and leapt into the arms of the curator on that Tuesday afternoon, just knowing that he could tell me more about the secrets hidden in the recesses of the Venice poem. My enthusiasm helped to forge an uneasy and very charged mentor-mentee relationship, but it also opened a literal door for me into what we called uh, at the library, we called the stacks, which was the place where the, arch where the arch archival material was held, including Duncan's. Um, and no one was really allowed to um, go into those papers of, of Duncan's, of his notebooks and his, um, and his uh, letters, all of his correspondence and all of his manuscripts. Uh, I recognized that the uh, curator was um, not even letting visitor scholar, visiting scholars look at that work and that um, graduate students weren't allowed to look at it. And so at some point that fall, I struck a deal that since I was a lowly undergraduate student and I was a girl and I, I was obviously of little threat to any scholarly researchers doing real scholarly work that I was the perfect candidate to catalog that collection. And, uh, and so uh, I did. 
uh, and every morning at 8.30 a.m., I rushed into the office of the archives and sharpened my pencils, and I stood in front of rows and rows of gray archival boxes filled with Duncan's 81 notebooks with that feeling of, I would say, a feeling of gnosis gathering that Psyche had when she turned her lantern towards Eros. Now, if you know Duncan, you know that he was probably a San Franciscan and that his work is infused with textures of the Bay Area and Pacific shorelines. And so too were his notebooks. Opening those boxes unleashed the smell of eucalyptus and rotting paper and fog dampness. That's the smell of the alleyways between the old Victorian houses in the Mission District. Eventually, I read every page of every notebook and as a courtesy to the Ahab-like curator, I created an index of what was on every page of every notebook, <laughs> which began to look like a map of Robert Duncan's mind. I say that the library was a place where Gnosis and Eros ran amok in that once I was wounded by that arrow, there was no other place I could happily be. What I learned through that experience is that the only thing that couldn't be taken away from me in the instability of the temporal world was my relationship to those eternal orders of Gnosis and Eros and the prophetic creative imagination. All of it led me away from the tedium of the Reagan era war mongering democratic capitalism that had swallowed up my adolescence. It makes me think of a poem of my own that was written around 1999, maybe 2000, and which I now see is really inflected with, with Duncan, but also with Jack Clark's influence in turning me toward a Homeric landscape. Um, it's a poem that I'll call, you know, I think of it as a song sung by Achilles, and it's called Future Poem. Future Poem. Straight out of the Abraham Lincoln place in the middle of a primary election year, which is snow inside the mind, outside the tree and on the screen. And if I were a cat, I would scratch my ears all day and wear a woolen shirt and have a mate named Jimmy. And we'd float away in a beautiful pea green boat that is just a dream, like the old people say, out in their old poems out in the field. And we are busy up outside inside our dreamscape with our boats. Don't bother me, Agamemnon. I am busy with my boat. Staying busy with an eternal boat is exactly what I'm doing when I'm in the poem. Duncan tuned my mind to the fact that humans are transcendent creatures when we manage to find the way there or the, the kingdom within, as if you want to use the uh, uh, scriptural. As, you know, as Jesus calls it, the kingdom within. But I, I'm happy to take that language out of um, the Judeo-Christian tradition and, and just um, bring it into a, a more secular mythic tradition for the moment. Um, there's a quote in one of those 81 notebooks of, of Duncan's that I cataloged. And this is from 19, one of his notebooks from 1957, exactly at the point that process and reality had entered into his reading. Uh, he says, our fates, our boundaries are only the boundaries of the imagination through which the creative forces move. What I had intuited about the potentialities of the poem were confirmed by Duncan and his circles, both the Black Mountain and San Francisco Renaissance, uh, that the poem was obviously not a static commodity. It was an organic system living in time and space. I had to uh, go back to the Duncan biography to remember exactly the moment when process and reality descended on the American poetry scene. It was when Duncan invited Olson, Charles Olson to read at the San Francisco Poetry Center in uh, 1957. And he gave some talks in Duncan's living room, uh, talks called uh, or derived from um, his work, this, The Special View of History. Um, And uh, Duncan says, uh, he says in a letter later to Robin Blazer, he says, he says, the great thing this year has been Whitehead's process in reality that 
that gives a grandeur it sets up a craving in me for large spatial architectures at the edges of chaos. My mind does not grasp it, but is grasped by it. I think all the poets, including myself, we skipped over the systematic reading of Whitehead. We were definitely not theologians and we just immersed ourselves haphazardly in the texture of process and reality, which was really like stepping onto the Pequod and being cast out to sea um, when I taught um, Duncan at, at Naropa, there was one student, Derek Fenner, bless his heart. He's an amazing guy. He read, we, we said, we're going to read process and reality. He read all of it and he came into class and he was ready to talk about it. And no one knew what he was talking about. <laughs> um, I'm going to, um, I'm realizing that uh, because I was doing screen sharing and being so down home with you guys, I, I've, I've, uh, going long and you guys are getting tired. So I'm gonna um, sk skip ahead a little bit here. I'm just trying to find the weave. Uh, all right, I got it. Here, here's the ta-da, all right. <laughs> it's funny to see now as I return to those old notebooks that my lifelong poetical influences congealed in a single season in the autumn of 1987. Three days a week, I spent my mornings and late afternoons reading Duncan's notebooks with an interlude between for Jack Clark's Homer class. Every Tuesday was a full day with Bob Creeley, a morning undergraduate introduction to American poetry, followed by watching him eat his lunch and drink from his thermos during his office hours, followed by his afternoon class graduate seminar. What was it like to be schooled by those white men? The answer is it was really just fine, even when it was less than perfect. Everything within those conversations about the poem prepared me to question my own embedded forms, my own assumptions about language, my whiteness and my privilege. And even when they were imperfect, like King David the whoremonger, they had their ears open to how organisms danced in relation to dance partners in their environment, how humans conspire against principalities and how, as Duncan said brilliantly, responsibility is to keep the ability to respond. They encouraged my earnestness. And I would go to the, to the etymology of that word earnest, to the, to the old English roots of it, you know, to find that, you know, that it's also, it's earnestness is about anger and desire and passion, all words that I associate with prophetic tradition you know, all words that recall poetry's true value and its ability to challenge the oppressions that rise up in human systems. I wanna close with a passage from Process and Reality that I find transcribed in one of Duncan's reading notebooks around Whitehead. He says, well, this is Whitehead. Uh, Each actual occasion contributes to the circumstances of its origin additional formative elements, deepening its own peculiar individuality. I'm gonna read it one more time because it's dense. Each actual occasion, actual occasion, he just means like people, places and things, right? Each actual occasion contributes to the circumstances of its origin, additional formative elements, which, you know, it's kind of a great, uh, because I'm now a, a, a minister in training, um, you know, what, what, what do you bring into the world with you? What do you, um, each actual occasion contributes to the circumstances of its origin, additional formative elements, deepening its own peculiar individuality. I hope that what I've said here helps to clarify the circumstances of my origin and the factors that shape my own peculiar individuality as a poet. But I also hope it's clear that in the spirit of the thinking of these white men and this tale of a white whale and this white headian cosmology, that this story, while indicative of some individual talent, is also part of a larger phenomenon that is the prophetic imagination as it moves through history. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, so folks have been using the chat. That was wonderful. Thank you, thank you. And uh, to Dandy. <laughs>
And I invite you to continue using it now to um, post questions or, or continue the conversation. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at, I'm just looking at it too. This is great. All right. You, you could you could also you guys don't even have to write it in the in the chat. You can also unmute. <laughs> this is true also. Yeah, right. So any questions, if you prefer to share in the chat, that's great or unmute yourself and ask away. Lisa, I'm I'm really struck by um, this image of you in the stacks. Um, yeah. And you going into the recesses, right? To use that term, and that that was sort of part of what enabled you to do that was your unthreatening girlness. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've just I'm struck by that um, uh, sort of what you were talking about the recesses in I think it was the Venice poem, and how that relates to um, I guess like a the earnest um, seeming like. In the in the light, like the brightness, or maybe the bright earnestness of a prophetic um, poem, like where where I'm struck by those kind of those two things together, and then like the recesses in some ways, feeling kind of like the space of like queerness and like girlness and stuff. Uh, um, so yeah, I don't. It's not a real question there. I just I'm picturing you in the stacks with these eighty one notebooks. Yeah. I think it is a question, Sarah. I think it's a it's a it's a really good one too because my sense is that the prophetic imagination or the prophetic act or what whatever you know the prophetic ministry, prophetic poetry can't exist without um, an attention to those recesses, right? Um, it's that that kind of ministry is spawned by. Um, that aware awareness and and also by um what you would call i mean if you wanted to you know think of it on a religious level what you would call the mystery um that it's that it's in those in those places and that most people don't see it yeah does that make sense um that but that's like a whole a whole book that's it's a it's a great question because it's like that's a whole other talk for someone else to write. <laughs> um, Aaron asked, "What about shipwreck?" Uh, Aaron was uh, was with me in those years at the University of Buffalo. Uh, the yeah, well, that's okay that the that the ship went down. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> that, that I was thinking of uh, the the there was a tra there's a biblical translation they changed the translation of what what does Paul say I was stoned stoned and shipwrecked I was stoned so many times and shipwrecked so many times Phyllis what is that line how many times was how many times was he stoned and how many times was he shipwrecked <laughs> oh it was a number of times <laughs> <laughs> but they but they. They changed it so it didn't sound like he was stoned like high. They changed. They changed. That's <laughs> stone. <laughs> Where do you see prophetic in poetry happening now? Um, I I I'm not um. I don't keep up, and I wish I did more. But I recently the. I saw the Poetry Project sent me their magazine, The Recluse, and it was all um, trans writers. And I was really impressed with their writing. Um, yeah, I think it's, again, it has to be at the margins. I think it, it has to be at the place where people can see what is, um, what needs to be addressed, right? So, 
um, I don't know, maybe someone else here knows better than I do how to answer that question, but it's not, it's not in the MFA programs. It's not, if you're being trained and you, they give you a class that's how to teach and you're in an MFA and they give you a class how to teach in an MFA program, that's not where the prophetic imagination is. Just my two cents, being judgmental again. Any other questions anyone would like to ask, either uh, unmuting or sharing the chat? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. It's, it's uh, Teddy here in uh, Milwaukee. Thank you, Lisa. Um, you know, Ezra Pound came up a couple of times, and I was just wondering, because I've, I've always had more gravity towards T.S. Eliot, and I'm kind of ashamed to say I don't know Pound's writing that well, but uh, in, in that sort of lineage, if you will, what where does where does Eliot fall sort of in this I this um this the, the whole topic of you know the the, the white men and the I, I'm just curious to what what your thoughts are on that on Eliot because I know I know him more much better than I know Pound. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at modernism, they're all white men, right? I mean, even the ladies are white men. They're all white. <laughs> Everyone's. Everyone's well. You can't get around it, right? I mean, the for a lot of reasons, but but the, I think that but Eliot's very interesting because of the prophetic. Because when if you look at the wasteland, and this is something that Robert Duncan talks about, and he has a whole lecture on it, on on the wasteland, where he talks about um, the wasteland as a prediction of the, of the atomic bomb, right? Mm -hmm. um, those unreal cities, the the the, vi the violet air, the violent. Air. If you go back to it and read it that way, um, he was keen on that. And you know, Duncan has his Gnostic kind of having his ideas, having grown up in a Hermetic Brotherhood. He's always looking for prophecy that's um, more like the magic, uh, the magic ball kind of crystal crystal ball kind of magic eight ball. <laughs> I was gonna say. Duncan was reading it that way, but but yeah, I I, I think the the wasteland is a is a wonderful poem if you can read it read its recesses rather than what is um, the footnotes in the um, in the anthology or how it's supposed to be read, right? Right. right. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I that I would add is that, you know, as I've been um, working through this lecture and thinking about it, I I don't want it to be like um, the th when I when I say what was it like to study with these white men, it was just fine. Like I don't want that to be the thing that like lets us all off the hook because, yeah, in that moment it was just fine there was something really important there were relationships i love these people um but it was Im imperfect and we're all imperfect and it's just like when we talk about structural racism it's not something that um we can say that we've um you know because we're poets we figured out and we did it and we're like better than anyone else like we haven't done it we haven't done the work i mean we it's impossible to undo what has been done and how much this is as one of my mentors uh at uh says you know this is the air we breathe we we live within a white supremacist culture so so i feel like you know what i'm doing in this talk is just putting in a f foundation of um don't throw out these poets because they're they have their own brilliance to them but at the same time like we have to really see the 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 privilege the unexamined privilege that is built into our traditions and um and into our lives and it's not like finger pointing or shaming it's just it's just a fact this is where we live. This is the land that, you know, you start with your land acknowledgement. This is the land we stand on. <laughs>
Thanks for that. And any other questions? So uh, uh, the prophetic imagination isn't an attempt to uh, escape your own time? No. So what do you think, Carl? Well, I, uh, um, somebody, you know, I'm a particular fan of Niedeker. Um, somebody was saying, well, she's the most local of poets. Yeah, and, and at the same time, the most universal, you know, because she's so local. Um, but she's not by, by any means outside of her own time, except in our imagination. Yeah, but um, but how do we um, talk about prophetic imagination in re relation to Niedecker and the objectivists? Um, I mean, it seems like they're right on they're part of that trajectory that I'm talking about out of Whitman and Dickinson and so on, that they're right onto the, the social conditions, right? I mean, in her work, it's built in the, the fact of her life as a working class woman mopping up the floors in the hospital, right? I mean, that's like, there's a lot within that, I feel like that is aligned with the prophetic tradition, prophetic imagination because she sees something bigger also the eternal in nature and um catalina is telling us yes the mud yes <laughs> right yeah the water the, the, or 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 often you know if it all went up in smoke that smoke would remain which is a quote from somebody else uh um which was the first thing i read of his uh, uh but, you know, I mean, when I grew up, I was wondering if, um, if uh, God had stopped speaking, you know, um, and, and um, he sure as hell had in Frost. <laughs> right. Well, it also depends how you define God. Right. right? Yeah. I should say, I, he, I, I said he, you know, <laughs> who knows. <laughs> right. <laughs> Bad habits. <laughs> he was probably white too, you know. <laughs> it's yeah. Well, I mean, this is but see, this is a thing that I this is why I I um I'm not I'm not gonna um step back on my judgment about poetry that um chooses not to do anything i find it boring like yeah. I, I you know like i don't want to read an imitation of life that's a that is a hallmark card um i wanted to be moved in the same way that um you know Phy phyllis and i are in a church together in the same way that the spirit moves through a service i want the spirit to move through a poem um and you can call that like you don't have again you don't have to be a christian to feel that Right. I mean, that's why we're we're all here anyway, because poetry moves us. Um, Chuck, you um, Chuck, uh, can you give me your um, email? I wanted to be in touch with you. Uh, so that we can have a long conversation about Moby Dick. <laughs> um, so you all, I just want to say thanks because um, it's so lovely to actually see f folks, your faces and to see friends and to be in community and um, uh, I miss you all. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, this has been remarkable. And thanks to everybody for all the questions and um, to Ellen and Begley Wright Lecture Series. And yeah, yeah this has just been incredible. Uh, and thanks to everyone for being here, sharing this space. I hope you'll come back and see us virtually in the new year. Um,
Until then, take care all. Okay, take care. Everybody be safe. Okay. Yeah. All right. Love you guys. Good night, okay. Aaron. Good night, Sarah. Love you too. Good night, Phyllis. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you.